Rosenthal. And I'm Oliver Rennick. afternoon with all three indexes finishing at new highs. But the question is, what do you miss? David Wu of Bank of America Merrill Lynch joins us on his favorite currency trade and why the second inning of Brexit may be worse than the first. Plus, Japan's Emperor Akihito wants to retire. We look at what this means for Prime Minister Abe's grip on power. And Home Depot stands out among retailers as Americans prioritize spending on their homes and cars rather than clothing. The earnings are out tomorrow and we have the charts you cannot miss. We begin with our market minutes. We have all three benchmark indexes closing at record highs. Yet again, another day, another record. But when you look at the volume, uh, trading in the down the S&P were double digit percentages below the 10 day average. So it is mid August after all. And earnings season is basically over. You've got a couple of stray retailers reporting here and there. Everyone's waiting for some kind of word from central banks. We talk a lot about volume on my team on stocks. And I will point out, as my editor always does, that if you actually look at the value of stocks, there's a lot of different ways to look at volume. Mm. The total value of stocks being traded is still pretty high, of course, because things are pretty rich. And of course, today uh, we saw the uh, real uh, safety areas of the market, utilities, telecom staples, lag, while some of the riskier areas like materials, industrials, energy uh, doing pretty well. All right, I'm going to jump in. And, uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into some market minutes here as we look at what's happening in the stocks. Uh, S&P, this is pretty interesting because you've had obviously a big shift here that's happened the past couple weeks. In particular, these three sectors doing very well today, materials, industrials, energy. Uh, these are groups that have been on a little bit of the rebound after not doing so well. Of course, uh, a, a little bit of strength in, in oil off of the uh, bear market lows that we had recently. So that's bleeding over into the energy index. Then if you flip it over, we're also looking at uh, basically some of the sectors that have not been been doing well uh, part of the rotation here so this is the year to date for utils and telecoms so yes they're still very far up uh, but they're hurting today they have been hurting recently uh, we'll see how that changes as we go into, into September and we get more clarity on the fed, fed rate hikes if they don't go maybe we'll see more reversal of that and then finally as we just pointed out this is just pretty incredible the five-year sort of look at the Nasdaq this was sort of the last uh, one to cross the all-time high recently yep. and there it is and another day another high tech stocks doing very well uh, here's a government bond market. Oh, well, let's start here. Here's U.S. 10-year yield. Uh, you can see down a little bit today, not too... Uh, there you go. Anyway, there's the 10-year yield. I think it was up a little bit on the day, but as you can see, we're still uh, very low in the grand scheme of things. I want to talk about one bond market we don't talk about very often, and that's the Chinese sovereign bond market. Huh. You basically never hear about this. No. It never comes up in discussion, but that is at a uh, record low or a new low on the 10-year bond there. Some bulls talk about uh, 2%, and for a lot of the same reasons that people are talking about everywhere, slow growth, low inflation, reach for safety, and so you see Chinese government tenure. This is, of course, uh, historical for China right. in, in terms of slow growth. And right. It, slow what, it, we're seeing it all around the world. Now we're, they're talking about it in China. All right. In currencies, I'm taking a look at the Aussie. It's firming before the Reserve Bank of Australia releases its minutes tonight. Uh, the currency building some momentum, rebuilding momentum, really, to test its highs from last week. Also, the British pound at a fresh 30-year low once it closes at these levels. You could see it's dipped below 129. Earlier, it dipped below 128 as well. This is the eighth decline in nine days. And as Joe mentioned, we get the first hard data on the U.K. economy after the Brexit vote in the coming days. You've got inflation, unemployment, retail sales, all of that. And the positioning heading into this is people are bearish. Uh, and then finally, let's take a look at oil, which had another nice update today, up over 3 percent. And oil was below $40 a barrel at the beginning of August, or around August 2nd. And everyone was turning negative, remember mm -hmm. the oil bear market, and it's come back pretty nicely. And so once again, people are optimistic, lots of hope that perhaps OPEC will do something to limit supply. And that's certainly helped the commodity currencies as well. Those are today's market minutes. Let's take a deep dive now into the Bloomberg. You can find all the following charts using the function at the bottom of the screen. I'm looking at investors' love affair with emerging market assets and how it's pushing valuation on EM stocks relative to developed market stocks to a three-year high. So let's focus on the top panel here. Uh, the white line is the Ford PE for emerging markets uh, and the expectations that the Fed will keep rates pretty much lower for longer, signs of economic stability in China, pushing analysts to raise their earnings estimates for those companies. The blue line, light blue line, is the Ford PE for de uh, developed market stocks. And you can see the gap there. And of course, we have different
different axes. So it's just kind of looking at how they've moved in different directions mm. or widened there. This bottom panel is the relative valuation. It's the spread between the two. So in other words, uh, people are paying the most in more than three years to own emerging market stocks rather than developed market equities. People wow. love EM again. They love EM. All right, we got uh, home builder confidence today. It wasn't a huge day for economic data, but I always like looking at this report. And it, came, it rose a little bit, but I always like looking at the regional breakdown where they ask home builders in different oh, cool. regions how they see things. And the top two lines, the blue and the white line, that's the west and the south. People like those home builders are still pretty optimistic about those areas. You can see they're in the uptrend. The line at the bottom is the northeast. There's nothing happening up here. There's no, <laughs> there's no space to build homes. No one's excited to move here. It's either too hot or too cold. And the Midwest is sort of in the middle, not doing great, but sort of hanging in there. So it really gives a nice snapshot. The West is doing great. South is doing great. Yeah. Everything else, uh, like, eh, not so hot. Huh. Very interesting. I like that. I'm not sure I would have expected that, so that's, that's pretty cool. I'm going to play some semantics games for my deep dive. Uh, I'm looking at bear markets within a bull market. So what we've done here is basically looked at the number of companies in the S&P 500 that went through bear markets during the time during which the S&P just kind of did nothing. We know from May of 2015 when we set the high to when we got back to that level and set a new high in July. So it obviously the market, it, right? yeah, we dipped and then we went back up. We kind of trended sideways. And uh, we had these two 10% corrections basically. We didn't obviously qualify for that bear market because there was never a 20% dip. But if you actually look at sort of the pain filled, if you try and characterize how many companies actually did go into bear markets, it's a lot. To be exact, it's 269 companies lost at least 20% or more and didn't regain it between May and July. So if you want to see how that compares to previous times, well, guess what? The only time in the past five years that looks similar to that is when we basically did go into a bear market in 2011. So, you know, we're still in the bull market, uh, but was there some kind of cleansing of sorts? I think so. Very cool. All right. David Wu, Bank of America's global head of rates and currency strategy, joins us now. David, thanks for coming back on the show. It's been too Thank long. You. Um, you've said that the, mo the defining characteristic of the market this year has been the simultaneous rally in everything. Stocks, bonds, it's all up. So if you're an investor and you want to construct a portfolio that isn't, you know, a, a portfolio that has different parts working at different times, what do you do when everything's moving in the same direction? Yeah, you know, it's actually funny. I mean, Joe, you mentioned this because I mean, I've, been, I've been back, I mean, basically the last month. Every client I've spoken to, except for the risk parity guys, telling me this has been a disaster year, right? People are, you know, whether it's real money that's underperforming their benchmark or basically macro hedge funds are struggling. I don't tell you most investors are having a very difficult year, except for the risk parity guys. The guys at AQR, the guys at Bridgewaters, the guys who are basically running systematic strategy based on the idea of risk parity. And, and these is, guys are killing it this year. So this is a chart of the Bank of America multi-asset strategy going back five years. And you can see since the beginning of this year, it's just been a rocket ship. Up. Exactly. And then typically these portfolios are very, very long treasuries and very long stocks. Right. And the idea is like, you know, the only situation in which both stocks and bonds are going to do well is in the face of monetary easing. So from that point of view, what the market has been banking on and continues to bank on is that, well, the Fed is going to gradually, very remo removing accommodation very gradually. But meanwhile, the U.S. will continue to import QE from Japan and from Europe. Right. And from that point of view, what's to, that's what's so striking. You look at your basic Bloomberg Financial Condition Index. We've seen a dramatic easing of that index. Okay, since Brexit, we've started to see pickup in data in the U.S., and yet the market continues to think that basically that the best way to basically to be uh, to be positioned in the second half of this year is for more monetary easing, and that's an amazing thing. Okay, so David, we've uh, talked about this uh, idea of the Fed model, which basically says that uh, equity uh, yield and bond yield should some should become a little more closer than they are right now. There's a lot of ways they can do that. One of those is that they can both lose value together. So are these uh, investors that are in the risk? parity type of funds that do have exposure to both, is there a chance that they could be getting harder going into the second half or, or if there's some kind of, uh, uh, you know, a shift in terms of, you know, these both these bull markets ending at the same time? Sure, I think so. I think, you know, like in the last time we saw something like this, obviously it was in 2012, right, during basically the unlimited basic QE forever. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to tell you, obviously in 2013, we had the whole taper tantrum that really shook things up. So from that point of view, the typical catalyst to basically bring about an unwinding of the risk parity portfolio, so to speak, is the backup in rates. Now, of course, you know, you could say that going to the September, you know, going to Jackson Hall, 
Right now, the market is pricing less than 10% chance of a hike in September. I mean, that to me is pretty amazing. You were just basically commenting before that we're starting to see the riskier assets, cyclical assets starting to do pretty well, in stocks at least. And yet, if people are getting more confident about growth outlook, clearly they somehow still think the Fed is going to be on hold. Mm. I think the other aspect of this, the probably the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest tail risk as far as the market position is concerned, obviously, is the election. Because I think the only way the market could be right is we end up with four more years of gridlock. Much like, you know, you know, like what we've seen in the last four years, which is very, very tight fiscal policy. Any other outcome, meaning that if either Republicans or Democrats manage to do a clean sweep in November, we're probably going to see a very significant easing of fiscal policy next year, and that definitely will be associated with the backup in rates. And I think that's going to be a big problem for the risk parity portfolio. And David, we love it when our guests mention our proprietary indexes. So we're going to pull up the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index because you mentioned it. But you also talked about this uh, volatility in the, in the different asset classes and how it's come down quite a bit. We talked earlier about positioning. Positioning right now seems to be trumping fundamentals. Why is it more pronounced this? This year than say in past years? I think a couple of reasons. I think the main reason is because I think investors are struggling. Let's imagine like, if you are like an investor who's struggling, right? What are you going to do? You're actually going to probably put on the same trade as everybody else because if the trade goes down, you probably still don't have your job. But if the trade, if, 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 if you're basically the only person putting on this trade and then you get it wrong, you're probably going to lose your job. And I'll give you another example in stocks, for example. What's happening is that as more money moves out of actively managed funds towards passively managed funds. Investors have to redeem, meaning redemption, they have to sell whatever is overweight. So by definition, whatever is overweight is underperforming. Mm -hmm. So I think lots of reasons why this is the case, but there is no question. It's almost gotten to a point now investors are reconciled to the idea that, you know what, you know, fundamentals don't even matter anymore, so people are not starting to chase so, momentum trades. So what specifically do you recommend that they do in, as opposed to just chasing what's going up? You know, Old honestly, cash? between you and you I, like I, I personally think if you go, if you go back to, since 1985, going into elections, usually people worry about the uncertainty premium. Right now, the way the market's position, I'm saying very long risk parity portfolio, very long, very short vol, would suggest the market thinks that Hillary Clinton is going to be basically a walk in the park for her. So from that point of view, I think that a lot of options look very attractive if you're looking to basically play for at least the transition, regardless yeah. of what your view may be. Mm -hmm. To me, the tail risk associated with the election, especially when it comes to basically a potential, you know, basically a clean sweep, including a potential Trump victory, I think something is very, very, very underpriced in the market. Right now. So perhaps been on volatility. All right, David Wu of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, you are staying with us. Coming up, does anyone still care about the Chinese yuan? The answer when we return. This is Bloomberg.
I'm Mark Crumpton. Let's get to first word news. Milwaukee, Wisconsin Mayor Tom Barrett says he believes outsiders are responsible for the rioting that's occurred following Saturday's shooting death by police of a black man. The mayor says a curfew in effect tonight in the Sherman Park neighborhood will be more strictly aimed at teenagers. I lived in that neighborhood for 11 years. I know many people who live in that neighborhood. They love their neighborhood. They're proud of their neighborhood. There are families who've been there for 20, 30, 40 years. They want their neighborhood back. Four sheriff's deputies were injured in clashes with demonstrators Sunday night. Mayor Barrett says he's seen a still photo that shows 23-year-old Slyville Smith had a gun in his hand when he was shot by police. Hillary Clinton and Vice President Biden hit the campaign trail together today in the vice president's hometown of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Biden took aim at Donald Trump, saying he doesn't care about the middle class and that no party nominee has been less prepared on national security and foreign policy than Trump. Biden told the crowd, quote, Clinton gets it. Speaking in Youngstown, Ohio, Trump said the Obama administration has downplayed the threat posed by Islamic State. He also discussed national security and said a new mindset is needed to take on what he called the ideology of radical Islam. An airstrike at a hospital supported by Doctors Without Borders in northern Yemen today. The international aid group says teams are still on the scene treating the injured. The New York Times reports at least 15 people were killed and dozens more wounded. A judge has settled a long-running dispute between Martin Luther King Jr.'s children over his Bible and Nobel Peace Prize. King's two sons wanted to sell the items, but their sister disagreed and refused to release them. King won the Nobel Prize in 1964. The Bible was used by President Obama during his second inauguration in January of 2013. A judge signed an order today releasing the items to Dr. King's estate. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Scarlett, back to you. Thanks so much, Mark. We're back with David Wu, Global Head of Rates and Currencies Research at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. David, uh, you've noted that investors seem to be indifferent to China's gradual yuan depreciation. I mean, we just came up on the one-year anniversary of the yuan devaluation, and since then, China's been gradually doing this. but. People don't seem to care that much. Why is that? I think one reason, I think the most important reason, I think, you know, China has now been very successful in terms of cracking down on capital outflows. So even the RMB is still going down. Capital outflows from China is definitely slow. As a result, they're not intervening as much. I'll tell you why that's important, because you know what? I just had um, lunch with my real estate agent the other day, and he was telling me last year, probably as much as 25% of apartments sold over $2 million in New York City were sold to a Chinese person. This year is at 0%. Zero. It's impossible for Chinese companies right now to try to get authorization to basically even make a direct foreign investment, especially funded in RMB. So the Chinese government really cracked down. They've actually closed all border. And this is the reason why China has not had to basically sell a lot of their reserves, whether it's stocks, commodities, or whatever else, to finance the FX intervention. So I think from that point of view, this is the reason why the sort of the ripple effect associated with the RMB depreciation has been fairly limited. So, uh, David, but right now your favorite trade, as you say, is long U.S. dollar versus Chinese uh, currency. So uh, if the depreciation there is kind of happening at a slower rate, uh, when does this trade materialize? Well, I, I think, you know, materialize, I think it, it could be actually the coming, basically, I think two, three months. I think for one thing, there's no doubt to me that the less the market cares about RMB going down, the faster the army is going to go. There's no question about that. Because if you ask me what was the single biggest surprise so far in 2016, is that notwithstanding the slowdown in China's economy, notwithstanding the fact that the Chinese stock market has been struggling, they have not cut interest rates. He said, well, how is that possible? Everybody else is cutting interest rates except for China. I think they're not cutting interest rates because this is what the central bank governor has been telling us of late, which is that they don't want more debt. They don't want more leverage. If they don't want to cut interest rates because they don't want more debt, then the only thing on the table left to stimulate the economy is a weaker RMB. So you mm -hmm. have to believe that the RMB has more room to basically fall. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit, talk about Japan. After the recent upper house elections, there was some hope that we might see a new vigorous uh, fiscal stimulus. The recent BOJ decision may have been a little bit of a disappointment, but they've said they would revisit their monetary policy framework. What do you see happening in Japan, and what are the implications for around the world? 
Joe, you know what? There is nothing more important to me than Japan right now. And it doesn't really matter. And it should be this, it should be for you, for everybody, whether you basically pay anything to to Japan or not. And that's because we're, we've all been going through Japanese vacation in the last few years. So in some sense, whether the Japanese is going to be successful or not, it's going to tell you a lot about what's in store for everybody else. All I know is this, and at this point, the only thing left at the table, as far as Japan is concerned, is probably helicopter money. And you and I know helicopter means basically, you know, Fiscal-led monetary expansion. We're talking about major fiscal stimulus. And I think from that point of view, yes, so far, they're talking about seven trillion you know, yen for six months. That's all very pretty. But that is not enough to actually get, basically get them going. So I think from that point of view, everybody wants to watch how bad things are going to get in Japan before they go down this path. I don't think we're there yet. Very quickly, does Japan provide the roadmap for what the rest of the developed world will look like? Absolutely. I'm just thinking about it. If you ask me what was the single most important day, in 2016 so far, it has to be January 29th on which day the Japanese cut rates to negative and Nikkei sold off and dollar yen sold off. I think that was when after that nobody's talking about negative rates anymore. Mm. So I think from that point of view, this is the most important thing. Japan is the most trapped in this low interest basically environment. Whether they're going to be able to get themselves out is going to tell you about what's going to be in store for everybody else. David Wu, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. Good to see you again, David. All right, coming up, we have the charts that you can't miss ahead of Home Depot's earnings next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Scarlett Fu. What you miss? Home Depot stands out among retailers, with Americans choosing to prioritize spending on their homes and cars rather than on clothes. So let's dig into how the data reflect that in today's The Numbers Don't Lie. So Home Depot's comparable sales have posted 20 straight quarters of growth. While the growth rate has vacillated, it's consistently held above 2% and hasn't been negative since early 2012. Now, these sales correlate with the remodeling market index, the white line, which basically surveys remodelers on a quarterly basis asking how much work they're getting. Any value above 50 indicates an increase, and while it has been dipping, it's still holding above 50. Now, the impressive run in same-store sales at Home Depot has lifted overall top-line growth. Revenue has climbed 20% from the bottom in 2010 and may reach $101 billion by 2018. 
More of that is also coming from online. According to Bloomberg Intelligence, e-commerce now makes up almost 6% of Home Depot sales, up from less than 2% in 2011. Online sales grew by more than 21% in the last quarter. Home Depot is also growing that by effectively merging its physical and internet businesses. 40% of online orders are picked up in Home Depot stores. And while analysts like to point out how much of America is overstored and overmauled, Home Depot has actually kept its store count flat at about 2,000 stores plus. Now, the industry's retail trends show up in the stock prices. You can see Amazon, Home Depot, and Lowe's have topped gains in Macy's and Sears. And investors, like customers, have been favoring online and home retailers over traditional department stores. We'll certainly be watching all these numbers when Home Depot reports earnings before the U.S. opening bell on Tuesday. Joe? For more on Home Depot, I want to bring in Bloomberg Intelligence's Seema Shah. Seema, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Home Depot, I mean, it's just been an extraordinary uh, stock, company, yeah. incredible chart. Uh, what is it going to take for this company to keep it going? I think they're going to have to put up a comp store number that's higher than the expectation of 4.8% and maybe show some acceleration from last quarter 6.6% was slightly decelerated from the quarter before, particularly because you heard negative commentary from Tractor Supply about how cooler weather affected their big ticket sales. And there's somewhat of a similar customer base. And May and July, both U.S. retail sales and um, building products was a bit slower. So okay. We're looking at that. To maybe piggyback on Joe's, you know, how mm -hmm. can this continue? I just pulled up Home Depot on Bloomberg and went to the function RV, which is relative valuation. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at an ROE of Home Depot of about 93%, which is just far beyond anything else <laughs> in its category. Uh, how does it get there and how does it stay there? Home Depot is an amazing operator. They have managed their supply chain extremely well. Um, they continue to improve operating margin. Gross margin is expected to be somewhat flat year over year because of the interline acquisition, which will anniversary in Q3. But overall, they could continue to drive sales, and they're getting leverage. And on the absolute bottom line, I mean, they're buying $5 billion worth of share. How dependent is Home Depot in a strong U.S. housing market? Because if home prices start falling or there's less confidence, does that mean people spend less or more on their homes? Um, I think that home, home price appreciation definitely has been driving home improvement sales, but I think that to a certain point, home prices are so expensive, it's hard for people to actually move, so they might actually be spending more on their homes because they can't switch homes. So if there is a little bit of a pullback, I don't think it'll necessarily affect them too much because, generally speaking, the age of the housing stock is over 30 years old, and there is new household formation with millennials. We just have a couple seconds. Sure. One of the themes of uh, earnings season has been more companies citing higher labor costs, crimping margins. Mm -hmm. What's Home Depot? Uh, situation with that? Um, I think they've just always, they've paid people fairly and they manage their supply chain. So they'll offset any higher increase in payroll and health care costs through the... All right. Yeah. Bloomberg Intelligence's Thank Seema you. Shah. Thank you very much. And looking forward to seeing those earnings tomorrow. All right. Coming up, NASDAQ introduces a new kind of order that allows investors to get priority in the trading queue. We're going to discuss the evolving market structure with NASDAQ CEO Bob Greifeld. This is Bloomberg.
I'm Mark Crumpton. Let's get to First Word News. President Obama is interrupting his vacation to raise money for Hillary Clinton. The president's headlining a Democratic Party fundraising reception tonight on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Proceeds from the event will benefit the Hillary Victory Fund, the Democratic National Committee, and state parties across the country. Ukrainian anti-corruption officials have confirmed that Donald Trump's campaign chairman's name appears in a list of so-called black accounts. That's a list compiled by the country's ousted president. Paul Manafort has denied any off-the-books payments from the Ukrainian government. The New York Times first reported that Manafort's name appears on a list of payments amounting to $12.7 million from 2007 to 2012. After a weekend manhunt, the suspect in the fatal shooting of a Georgia police officer has been arrested in Florida. The suspect was discovered hiding in the trunk of his sister's car. Authorities say Officer Tim Smith was responding to a suspicious person call in Eastman, Georgia, when he encountered the suspect. Smith exited his patrol car and was shot. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe marked the 71st anniversary of the end of World War II by sidestepping a visit to a controversial shrine. Two of Abe's cabinet ministers did go to the Yakusina shrine, and Abe sent a ritual donation. That's likely to irritate China and South Korea, who see the shrine as a symbol of Japan's past militarism. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Joe, back to you. All right, let's get a recap of the market action today. And there you see all three major indices levitating again, new record highs across the board. Nothing all that dramatic except the fact that it feels like day after day after day, just higher as a price. I like the way you use that word levitating because that's what it feels like, just drifting higher on fairly low volume, even as economic data. And today we got Empire Manufacturing coming in a bit worse than expected. Right, just the subtle, the subtle ascent. I think sent. there is one thing that was interesting today, a couple reports uh, by Bank of America. When you look about the sector rotation where technology stocks doing well, uh, utility stocks not doing so well, it's kind of getting investors bullish where if you actually look at long contract positioning on the S&P in the past week and really throughout this quarter, they've been selling treasuries, buying U.S. stocks, which is not something we've seen. It's not something we've seen. All right. Well, what'd you miss? The Nasdaq's next big move. The exchange operator just introduced a new type of order it says is geared towards long-term investors. Nasdaq is rolling out this function called Extended Life Orders to compete with IEX. The startup begins trading on Friday as a stock market with a 350 microsecond delay to orders, a speed bump. For more, we're going to hand it over to Bloomberg's Betty Lou for an interview with Nasdaq CEO Bob Greifeld. Betty? Okay, guys. Thank you so much. I love how you're kind of a little bit bored there with the records, <laughs> record after record here in the stock markets. Bob, good to see you. Good to be here, Betty. Okay, so talk to us about this Extended Life Order. How is this different from IEX's speed bump? Well, we spent a lot of time talking to stakeholders, buy side, sell side, anybody really interested in the marketplace. And one thing we heard loud and clear is, especially from technology-focused uh, people, is they didn't like a speed bump where you were delaying the onslaught of technology and its progress. Right. And so whatever exists today from a technology point of view will look archaic five years from now. So we wanted to do something that wasn't negative and restrictive, but positive and empowering. So what we did here is it said, if you want to put an order in for a longer period of time, we will give you a reward. And that reward is very large and very important. That is, if you are a We're going to bump you up the You're going right? to go to the front of the line, okay. to the front of the queue. So that means you'll get the earlier execution. So if you are a bit slower, right, if you could be a microsecond, a millisecond, a day, a week, a month slower, but if you're willing to make a commitment, then you'll get that reward of going to the front of the line. So a major evolution of market structure. Uh, but what happened here, Bob? Because you protested, you did not want the SEC to approve IEX, and you were against these speed bumps. So, so what happened here? We were against the process. We think the SEC clearly did not carry out their responsibility. So the rule of the land says that your quote has to be immediately accessible without artificial delay. Right. Now, if the SEC wants to change that, it should have gone through a normal way, comment and review, 
and let the market adjust to that. Didn't happen. So, uh, what, that so was you, you can't beat them, so just join them? No, no, we're, we're uh, objecting to the process. And this order type we have to uh, uh, submit has to go through normal comment and, and review. We in the past had tried to present to the commission something like a speed bump, and it didn't uh, get the commission's approval. They didn't want us to go through that process and review. So the process is one thing. So we obviously use that as a way to start thinking about how can we improve the investor experience? And we heard a lot of issues with respect to this artificial delay being put in. Right. And we said, okay, what can we do? And we've got to listen very hard to our customers. And our customers said, we want to have the ability to be rewarded by the fact that we're a long-term investor. We don't care about the microsecond differential. And this reward has the great advantage of being simple. When you think about a speed bump, as you try to explain that to people, mm -hmm. how it's implemented, it's very complicated. You talk about a limit order that has to have a second or so duration that goes to the front of the line. People understand that. But, but Bob, who is asking for this, though? Who exactly? Well, I would say we haven't found anybody who doesn't want this type of capability in the marketplace as we okay. scratch the surface. And as I say, the simplicity of it is really what's appealing to a large number of people. Clearly, we think the initial adopters will be the buy side who doesn't care about the microsecond and says, okay, I'll give you a second, I'll give you two seconds if I can get to the front of the line in terms of front of people who are faster than me. So that's the, the, that. But we also think that uh, the firms that are engaged in high degrees of trading today will figure out positive ways to use this capability in time. You know, Bob, uh, just some of the reaction, though, uh, to, uh, you know, to hearing about this uh, has been, look, you know, NASDAQ increasingly has been focused on technology right and technology helping we to, have to be uh, you have to be and you have to speed you ha speed is everything uh, in this market at, at least that's what it's been up to now so some are saying as that business grows as technology is delivering more speed on your on on, on on the on that side of your business why would you want to introduce a product though that could slow that process down so one I would disagree with the comment speed has been uh, everything in the market uh, capital typically is a dominant factor in the market if somebody wants to commit a uh, to buying a position or selling a position that seems to make the largest difference there okay. but we cannot ever be in a position to say we want to stop technology so technology will advance the great uh, uh, part of this announcement is in a very simple way we allow that technology to continue there's no speed bump there's no artificial delay but you have a choice uh, now with this order it changes market structure where you can have an advantage uh, by going to the front of the line by making a commitment to the marketplace by being there so I think it's the perfect balance Bob hadn't you said before though that introducing new orders is going to complicate the markets even more well, what I said is if you have a speed bump that has 350 microseconds, somebody else can come out with a 340 microsecond or 330 or 320. That will complicate the market. The beauty of this approach, it simplifies the market. We all can understand it quite intuitively. As my folks presented it to me, I said the, the genius of this is the simplicity. You make the commitment, you go to the front of the line, hard stop. So when I think about going back in time when our markets were formed in lower Manhattan on the street corner, first thing we had was a market order. Right. You know, after that, people came up with a limit order. I would submit to you that this advance where we have a limit order that has an advantage based upon a commitment to it will represent a fundamental evolution of market structure similar to what we saw with limits coming in after market orders. Uh, Bob, I can't let you go without talking about the IPO market, right? So Okay. So we know how dismal it has been here in the U.S. So let's talk about another area of this world where it seems to be that some companies are on the pipeline to go public. I'm talking about Asia in particular, right? So there's a few companies, Lufax, Didi Chuxing, people are looking at those companies to, uh, to, to break out into the public. Lately, we've seen Asian companies want to stay there because they're getting higher valuations. How do you get them over here? So the first thing I would say is I think the IPO market is disappointing but not dismal. Right, and we have seen. What's the a, difference? Uh, well, we've uh, the fact that companies are coming public. The window is not shut. Uh, we've seen a number of companies come public in the last two months, and also the pipeline is building. We hope to have a stronger uh, fall once we get past the summer part. You know, with respect to our attraction on a global basis, it comes down to the fact that we have the depth of liquidity, we have knowledgeable investors, we have a very strong analyst community, and if you're looking to have your company be fully valued over the long 
long period of time, there's nothing like the U.S. equity markets. All right, Bob, good to see you. Good to be here again. This Blaine. afternoon, Bob Greifeld, NASDAQ CEO. And Scarlett, I'm going to toss back to you with some breaking news. That's right, Betty. American International Group, AIG, has agreed to sell mortgage insurer United Guarantee to Arch Capital. This is, of course, part of CEO Peter Hancock's uh, plan to sell assets and cut jobs to boost margins. This deal is valued at $3.4 billion, including $2.2 billion in cash and the rest in Arch Securities. Coming up, Donald Trump laid out his plan to prevent terrorist attacks on American soil. We've got the details. This is Bloomberg. What you miss? Donald Trump laying out his plans for combating the Islamic State today at a speech on foreign policy. The Republican presidential nominee is calling for an ideology test to screen for terrorists. The time is overdue to develop a new screening test for the threats we face today. I call it extreme vetting. I call it extreme, extreme vetting. Our country has enough problems. We don't need more. And these are problems like we've never had before. All right, joining us now for more on this is Bloomberg News White House editor Alex Wayne. And Alex, uh, in this new proposal on uh, Donald Trump's prohibition against Muslim immigration, how exactly would this extreme, extreme vetting work? Well, it's not altogether clear, but as, as you said, it would be something of an ideology test. He says we only, we only want people coming to the United States of America who are, embrace our culture of uh, tolerance. Uh, how that would be applied is kind of an open question. He didn't go into a lot of detail. All right, he didn't get into a lot of detail, which is kind of what we've come to expect. He's also been criticized uh, by many foreign policy experts, including some in his own party, for his inexperience and perhaps ignorance of international affairs. So did he help himself today? Uh, I, I, I doubt it. I think the, the folks, especially in his own party, the, uh, the, the senior Republicans, uh, 50 of them who sent a letter earlier this, this month criticizing him and saying that he would present a risk uh, if elected, I don't think they're going to be swayed by this speech, although he did, uh, he did correctly name the, the King of Jordan and the President of Egypt. All right, so maybe there's that in, uh, in his favor. <laughs> and of course, uh, meantime, Hillary Clinton campaigned today for the first time with Joe Biden, the vice president. What did they have to say about Trump? I mean, obviously, they, they have a pretty s consistent uh, tone there when it comes to Donald Trump. But what specifically did they say? 
They do. Hillary Clinton again called him unfit for the presidency. Uh, Joe Biden was kind of the more interesting of the two. He said that uh, Donald Trump's recent claim that President Barack Obama founded ISIS, the uh, terrorist group, presents a threat to U.S. troops in the Middle East. It uh, raised the raised the risk a couple of clicks. He said that they might uh, they might suffer attacks. All right, Alex Wayne of Bloomberg News. Thank you so much, our White House editor. Thank you. All right. Let's now turn to Japanese politics and the challenges facing Japan's Emperor Akihito as he seeks abdication. The 82-year-old's desire to step down challenges political precedent and would require a change in the law. The problem to amend that would open the way for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's government to revise its pacifist constitution. Joining us now is Sheila Smith, Senior Fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Okay. Sheila, welcome. Uh, so what's going on here? What, I guess, uh, can we expect to play out in the next couple of weeks as we uh, find out Akihito's intent to step down? Thank you. It's great to be with you. I think there's two things happening here. One is in a video released to the Japanese people, the emperor said that he would l rather step down before his death, allowing a succession that was smooth and steady and wouldn't affect the lives of everyday Japanese, that that kind of succession is really what he has in mind. And as you pointed out, though, this comes uh, in the backdrop of a fairly healthy Japanese debate over whether or not to begin talks on revising its constitution. No one at this moment thinks that the Akihito's request will require touching Article 2 of the Constitution, which defines the role of the Japanese emperor, but it comes at an interesting time in Japanese politics. It certainly does, because um, Shinzo Abe, of course, did very well in the latest elections, and uh, he's been very vocal in his push to stimulate the economy. What does this do in terms of, of the balance of power on Shinzo Abe and his party? Well, there's two things here. One is, as you mentioned, there was a, an election in July for the upper house. And for the first time in the post-war period, people who were pro-revision, in other words, people who were open to talking about constitutional revision, uh, managed to win. So Abe's ruling coalition, his own party, the LDP, and its uh, smaller partner, Kome, are going to be guiding this conversation in the diet. Kome, however, is not necessarily enthusiastic about the kind of revisions Mr. Abe has long advocated. So there's a tempering influence inside the ruling coalition itself. The larger question, though, is the Japanese economy. And I think Mr. Abe's leadership will be judged by the Japanese people, not on whether or not he revises the Constitution, but rather on whether he manages to stimulate growth in the Japanese economy. Wages remain very low. There hasn't been a lot of change as far as the ordinary Japanese family can tell. Um, and so he's still trying to manage his conversation with Japanese companies to see whether or not they will let go of some of their profits and invest in his country and in the, in the labor, Japanese labor force. And how would you assess his chances on that? I mean, he's been in power for, for several years. There have been attempts at fiscal stimulus. Right. The efforts by the BOJ, you know, right. I would say mixed at best. He does, there have been new hopes of stimulus, uh, both fiscal and monetary, especially since this election. But uh, do you see any real prospects for turning a corner in a positive way? And is there anything he can do specifically? Well, I think we've, we, we're watching Japanese policymakers, the prime minister and his cabinet, move back to a more traditional approach to stimulate growth. He has a huge stimulus in the works now, which includes lots of infrastructure, infrastructure building to rural uh, locales where there are fewer people. Uh, he's had, uh, he's tasked a couple of senior LDP people uh, to think about ways in which to, you know, bring a lot more of the population that's concentrated in Tokyo out to these rural areas. So I think there, he's using stimulus and this kind of vision of a revitalized Japan uh, to speak largely to rural problems and rural needs. The BOJ, as you mentioned, is fairly limited in what more it can do, although uh, Mr. Kuroda can turn, continues to advocate that he has some uh, influence at his disposal. They will still be part of the mix, obviously, but I think the, the, the Abe cabinet, given the difficulty he's been having, is really falling back on some older patterns of mm. spend more. And they've walked back, of course, from the fiscal concerns, the fiscal conservatism and the, con the consumption tax that was about to be imposed on the Japanese consumer. He's right. pushed that off now for a couple of more years. And Sheila, as you know, Shinzo Abe has famously pushed for womenomics. So to bring it back to uh, the, the emperor, what are the odds that in the next century Japan will have an empress rather than an emperor as its uh, symbolic head of state? 
Well, that's, that, that's really lurking behind this question of how far will, will the succession process and the law that governs the succession process be debated on the floor of the Japanese parliament. In, in, in 2005, we had a similar conversation because, as you know, the crown prince and princess have a daughter. Uh, and they moved to get outside experts, a variety of social experts, to come to advise the prime minister at the time, Mr. Koizumi, on a succession process, how to think about the steady and smooth transition of power. And they recommended female succession in that report. A month or so later, however, the crown prince's younger brother and his wife gave birth to a son. Right. And there, then the law was tabled and it was put off, more or less, for, for another day. So there's a lot of speculation, I think, today that there will be not just a response to Emperor Akihito's response to request to step down, but also a kind of broader look at succession itself and whether I think the female succession question will come back. All right, thank you very much, Sheila Smith from the Council on Foreign Relations. Coming up, real estate billionaire and senior Trump economic advisor Tom Barrick discusses Trump's stance on entitlements and gridlock in Washington. This is Bloomberg. I'm Scarlett Fu. What you missed? Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump's economic plan has so far not mentioned entitlements. Trump's senior economic advisor and Colony Capital chairman Tom Barrick says there is a reason for it. He explained earlier to Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker in an exclusive interview. If you take the budget, entitlements are 67 percent of the budget, right? Mm -hmm. uh, interest today on our deficit is another 7 percent. Defense is another 13 or 14 percent. So do the math. There's very little left, right? We, so everybody talking about what they're going to do, and you look at entitlements and say that's 67 percent. You've got to move it. But why does nobody talk about it? Nobody talks about it because the American public doesn't want to reduce entitlements. The American public still wants more for less. It's not the American way. It's not the system that's failing. It's us that's failing. And, and why? Because we have built a prison in which we are the prisoners. So when we talk about the Department of Commerce, or the Department of Interior, the Department of Energy, none of us have any idea what they do. But the allocation of revenues to all of these massive departments across government are humongous. It's not just the distributions to us of what we see in healthcare, True. education. 
or, 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 or defense. So somebody has to take accountability of what is that budget? Where are the revenues going? And Which what is the precisely why I ask, Tom, isn't this a clarion call to Donald Trump to take leadership on entitlement reform? Yet there's not a word yes. in his economic plan about entitlements. Well, not yet, right? I mean, th what you will see is the rolling out of these pieces, because it's, it's kind of parry and thrust on the economic issues that are at the top of the list. Entitlement reform is not a, a wonderful, politically accepted act, right? It, but it if takes you're going, courage, true, takes if you're going to be a disruptor, pardon me again for interrupting you, but if you're going to be a disruptor, which is how you've described Donald Trump and the Donald Trump candidacy, shouldn't you be willing to embrace and champion these unpopular, admittedly unpopular ideas, like entitlement reform? Absolutely, and I think you're going to see it. And an entitlement reform is, is also part of dismantling all of these bureaucracies that are in place, and that takes a little bit of time and analysis. We still have 80 days left. You're, you're going to see it, and you're absolutely right. It's almost 70 percent of the budget. That was Colony Capital's Tom Barrick in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. And a programming note coming up on Bloomberg Television tomorrow morning, we've got Sam Zell, Equity Group Investments Chairman and Founder, Andrew McKenzie, CEO of BHP Billiton, as well as Wilbur Ross, Chairman of WL Ross. Coming up next, what you need to know to gear for tomorrow's trading day. This is Bloomberg. Krugman tomorrow on What'd You Miss? We'll be discussing the presidential election, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, which one is better? And also, don't miss this. Tomorrow morning, UK CPI, 4.30 a.m., we begin the hard data on what happened to the UK economy post-Brexit vote. And then once you're up at 4.30 a.m., an hour and a half later is Home Depot earnings at 6 a.m. Eastern time. And then at 8.30, we get the U.S. CPI, core CPI that excludes food and energy, expected to rise 2.3% from a year ago period. That's all for What'd You Miss. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.